So, first of all, uh, thanks very much, uh, Professor Huang Sun-Chun, uh, for the invitation to be here. And also to uh, Lu Wu Yang uh, for all of the logistics. It's been amazing, uh, the work that's gone into making this meeting possible. So, first of all, translator, can you hear me okay? Thanks. Uh, I decided to prepare a very different paper the last few days. Um, uh, partly because, you know, I came to understand the situation we're in a little bit better. Uh, but also, I have to say, because the abstract that I initially wrote for this event was too hard for me. Um, uh, you know, the reason I write abstracts, like many of us, I suspect, is to um, uh, kind of set a program for possible work to do. And um, I, I never have that work prepared. Uh, and, and so now I decided to prepare something that helps ease into the kind of topic that I wish to speak of today, which is um, what I'm calling provincial media theory. Uh, this is about, you know, the limits of thought and practice, um, I think, in a way, the limits and the circumstances. So there's been some sort of talk of, of localism, um, the local in our, our meetings today, the situation, and I want to think about um, some of the implications of that position uh, in the talk today. I start off with the introduction, a personal trajectory a little bit, because I think um, very few people here know anything about me uh, or where I've come from, and then I'll move into the discussion of uh, provincial media theory or, or media theory at its limits. Um, uh, and then <coughs> I want to propose a, a concept called the interval um, in answer or response or dialogue uh, with some of the talks we've heard this morning uh, from Rob and, and Chris in different ways. Um, and I'll finish up there. It should take about 30 minutes. Uh, so by way of introduction then, um, you know, despite wanting to talk about provincial media theory, I bring a, a transcontinental perspective to media theory, uh, one that in many ways is born out of my own personal trajectory working and living across Asia, uh, Europe and Australia. Though for the past eight years, I've been based in Sydney at the Institute for Culture and Society at Western Sydney University. Uh, my approach then has also been deeply informed by the experience, like many of the projects we've been here in the last few days, of collective research on a series of projects investigating the interrelations between infrastructure and economy, territory and subjectivity, governance and labor, in cities and sites such as Beijing, Shanghai, Ningbo, um, Sydney, Calcutta, uh, Athens and Valparaiso, a port city in Chile. More recently, uh, our work has been based in Singapore and Hong Kong. So I now want to take you through a very brief and quick overview of four of these projects that have defined for me the last decade or so of work. And I begin here um, with this project. Um, this project was about a counter-mapping of creative industries in Beijing around uh, 2007 working with architects and designers, filmmakers and theorists to study topics uh, such as migrant labor, um, information geographies, waste economies, artist villages, um, and market engineering. In migrating media and urban research outside of the university, the project drew on artist and activist projects in Europe uh, to develop a prototype of what we called platform research that went on to define the um, successive projects after this. Uh, this was, of course, pre-smartphone. And um, we also undertook um, some open street mapping. In, in fact, I think we produced some of the first open street mapping in Beijing at the time, um, using um, uh, this uh, mobile computer device that Luca Freyler from Ljubljana, a hacker, 
had developed on his, um, uh, that could be strapped to the back of his bicycle. It was a sort of form, if you like, of location media, right? Located media. <coughs> and um, we went on to make a special issue of Urban China magazine, a really wonderful magazine that m might still be around, I don't know. But at the time, uh, people out of Beijing and Shanghai were doing a lot of uh, really kind of interesting policy interventions uh, around, for instance, Sichuan earthquake at the time, uh, various other kind of urban proposals. Uh, and I think they were uniquely situated in their capacity to dialogue with policymakers and planners at the time. And so it was quite a kind of thrill to have an open license to design this uh, with one of our friends in Amsterdam uh, and, and sort of play with a kind of, um, uh, you know, a logo language in a way um, across a number of topics. Our next project was transit labor. And this is where we kind of scaled the research up to investigate circuits of labor and logistical operations in Shanghai, Calcutta and Sydney. Our collective research here was focusing on electronic waste industries in China, uh, IT towns in Calcutta, um, and labor regimes in shipping and transport industries in Sydney. We studied how global infrastructural and software standards stitch spaces, labor, and operational procedures together across diverse geographical spaces and modalities of time. Uh, the third project, which we've just kind of finished, was our research that was moving between Athens, Calcutta, uh, and Valparaiso. And here we're investigating regimes of circulation and containment that connect China's manufacturing industries to different corners of the world. Our interest was in how infrastructure and software combine as technologies of governance that coordinate and control logistical operations and labor practices situated in select sites uh, along China's uh, centered trade network known as the Belt and Road Initiative, which was also referred to as, you know, One Belt, One Road, or, you know, the New Silk Road. It had a few uh, variations on its moniker there. The f fourth project... Yeah, I mean, interesting, okay, we're doing work in, 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 uh, in uh, Piraeus, the port of Athens, which was a very interesting site, which I could talk a lot more about, um, that was part of um, you know, China's expansion into Europe uh, through infrastructure. And um, you know, methodologically, this presented various challenges. Uh, we also you know, actually produced a, a demo video game there, um, not in the way that we wanted at all, <laughs> but uh, in a way that the kind of game designers wanted to make. And, and we sort of played around with our, our various sort of modes of publication and dissemination there as well. The current project that we're investigating is called da uh, Data Farms, and it's uh, interested in extending this sort of planetary scale level of digital infrastructures, labor regimes, and technologies with world making capacities to study um, data center industries in Singapore, Hong Kong, and um, Sydney. The project here is exploring the relevance of data centers for the Asian digital economy and asks how facilities for the storage, processing, and transmission of data hold implications for state sovereignty and the transition to societies of automation. So these projects have also been enhanced and complemented by additional projects in Germany, including various workshops on enterprise resource planning software systems, or ERP, on computational cities, uh, critical organizational studies, and algorithmic cultures at the Center for Digital Cultures at Lufana University in Lüneburg, um, not far from Hamburg. And we've also been working with Humboldt's uh, University's uh, Berlin Institute for uh, Migration and ran a summer university there on investigating logistics, forms of life, migration, and the commons. This latter event has been complemented with some follow-up research to study the intersection between logistics and migration in Duisburg, which is one of the key economic and industrial sites for Germany uh, within China's strategic um, Belt and Road Initiative. 
So what I want to shift to now um, is this um, discussion of, of media theory from the provinces. Uh, another sort of inflection that we could give to the idea of provinces, of course, is the margins, uh, a, a term that kind of disappeared in the 90s with the advent of economic globalization, the collapse of the Soviet bloc, uh, and this sort of um, valorization of a, a world without borders. Uh, in fact, I think, you know, being in Hangzhou right now, we can clearly speak of margins in a spatial sense, uh, and China delineates this very clearly with the notion of first, second, third tier cities. Uh, so what can we do, in other words, from the margins? This is the kind of position I wish to kind of explore for the rest of my talk. Like all theory, uh, media theory is troubled by provincialism, even if it struggles to take note of this common condition. You may recall how Heidegger famously refused to chair in Berlin, instead preferring to stay in the provinces. So there's something positive to be said about provincialism, it can provide conditions for the crafting of unique concepts that, when combined with deep historical knowledge, generate a legacy that spans generations. But what happens when ontological conditions change from the security of the earth to the technical contours of media systems? These are our conditions now, and we need to find and explore different techniques of concept production imminent to media situations of patterns of prediction patterns in prediction and complexity and control. Wherever we may live in the world, we need to overcome provincial thought, which all too often can be an impasse to engage in contemporary media infrastructural forces and models of practice that shape the lives of many. Let me be clear here. I'm not making a distinction between the provincial and some variant of neoliberal globality. No, uh, we're always already provincial. This is our situation. The trick is to collectively design transversal relations and technical architectures that stitch provinces together in ways that allow us to encounter the production of difference and unsettle social technical regimes of perception. We need an acknowledgement that the concepts we create have got limited reach. Our task then is to explore where they go and work and, and what they can do. So my work then is motivated in part by the question of what happens when, uh, you know, media theory uh, opens itself to the world. Addressing this question means in part building an openness to transcontinental methods of collective research and concept production. And it's in this next section that I wish to say a little bit more about concept production. So my approach is one that strives to produce concepts out of the collective experience of critical empirical research. Increasingly, I find myself reading technical manuals and industry reports for conceptual inspiration. Here, one might take note of China again, and the five-year plans and reports coming out of the startup sector and industry developments in artificial intelligence and machine learning as a way to discern the contours of geopolitics through infrastructure. Media are geopolitical because they extend over space. And they're also chronopolitical because they produce the rhythms and pulses of economy, labor, and life. Philosophy rarely generates new concepts these days, and more often than not functions to police thought and restrict invention. In approaching the problematic of contemporary geopolitics, my method and analytical technique has started with the media question, which so often nowadays is also an infrastructural question. There is no place for template theory if one wishes to engage and encounter the world, which is a world, as we acutely know, undergoing quite chaotic planetary crisis on lines that cross ecology and society, economy and politics. Template theory is something like the desire to take canonical reviews, uh, views and reapply them across conditions and situations. While our historical condition is not entirely new in all of its aspects, there's a sense of singularity in our current moment that demands that we revisit our ideas of what theory is, what it can do, and what its responsibility toward the world might be. Nowadays, we need media theoretical approaches alive to the dynamics of the world, approaches that are alert to epistemology and history, but not reducible to them. 
Within systems of algorithmic governance, epistemology has become subsumed into techniques of policing society, which I'll say more about shortly. But we do not need to submit to the calculus of power. It is very hard to fight the seemingly endless wave of negativity that infuses our daily lives. But we can, we have to accept, we do not have to accept, rather, um, the position of techno-pessimists. Here, I'm thinking of inspiring examples, which I mentioned a few days ago um, in Hong Kong, of the 2014 umbrella pro-democracy movements and their use of distributed computing through Bluetooth networks of communication. I'm now going to shift uh, scale to talk about the global in relation to technical regimes a little bit. The transcontinental perspective that I foreground, uh, uh, that I adopt rather, foregrounds the variational ways in which digital technologies of control and interoperability are troubled and disrupted by social technical instantiations of inoperability. So in fact, I'm quite hostile to notions of interoperability, which is what we've been talking about this morning. I think we need to explore and be ready for inoperability um, precisely. This is also the moment of the political. Systems, in other words, are always prone to breaking down. Networking, as uh, Gert Lovink reminds us, is also about not working. Such forms of unsettling regimes of power manifest in many ways. Take, for example, the peasant communities in the new IT town and smart city of Rajarhat on the outskirts of Calcutta, who engage in willful acts of infrastructural sabotage in response to the violence of dispossession wrought by the West Bengal's government's invocation of a colonial administrative act, the Land Acquisition Act of 1894. Through the special, through the special Economic Zone Act of 2005, the government was able to legally conjure a zoning technology for Rajahat designed to attract foreign capital to finance the transformation of fertile agricultural land and fisheries into non-agricultural use. Peasant populations numbering in their tens of thousands experienced economic and social displacement as a result of the process of primitive accumulation, or what David Harvey prefers instead to term accumulation by dispossession. In the case of Rajahat, the expropriation of land and the partial remobilization of peasant labor forced into service villages are the conditions of possibility for what I call the logistical city and its starter economy. Infrastructural sabotage of roads and fiber optic cables is one way of thinking the constitutive outside that attends the media infrastructural transformation currently underway across many sites of the world. In the case of um, electronic waste industries in China, we see a quite different form in which supply chain capitalism to invoke a term of anthropologist Anna Singh, is confronted with the limits of protocological totality. In other words, it's confronted with the limits of interoperability. The logisti logistical software architectures that feature in shipping industries, warehousing and distribution centers are also operative within supply chains that shift toxic infrastructural waste around the planet. Here, uh, there is a strong informal sector at work in the collection and dismantling of discarded, decommissioned electronic devices. This informal sector uh, does not use the hugely expensive, technically complicated and frequently bug-prone uh, enterprise resource planning software such as SAP and Oracle. Uh, rather, the often illegal e-waste industry maintains its networks using everyday software pre-installed in computers or easy to download. So at the time that I was doing this research, it was applications like SMN, uh, Skype, Weibo, and so forth. You know, at least that, that, that's how it was in the uh, informal sectors in the e-waste industries in Zhejiang uh, about a decade ago. My point is that the use of software in the informal sector presents a protocological incompatibility or border with the high-end ERP software. This means that the logistical world, driven by the impulse to make everything accountable, calculable, and transparent, 
is confronted with a constitutive outside, secondary economies of waste that due to protocological disjunctures and platform silos are not registering within meta-level technologies of control. Similarly, this results in a special form of subjectivity, the production of what I call non-governable subjects, which is an interesting proposition in a country like China, where, as we repeatedly hear, there is a massive rise in investment in research and development in AI and facial recognition technologies. Recent uh, governmental technologies like Alibaba's Sesame social credit system and the platform variations that make everything and everyone visible and financialized within a control paradigm of preemption and prediction are hardly exclusive to China. Such technologies are being rolled out across the world. I think it's important to note that while Western news media report on China's facial recognition technologies and social credit systems of Tencent and Alibaba as if they were totalizing technical regimes, from what I understand there is considerable variation in platform architectures and their techniques of capture across and beyond the provincial spaces of the nation. The extent to which um, the uh, these data extraction and aggregation platforms step into the world with such power is indicative of the erosion of trust and amplification of despair and depression following decades of social upheaval wrought by structural and economic transformation. Computational systems and technical architectures may address the problem of trust in transactional ways that scale. However, despair and depression tend not to respond well to solutions. So, you know, I think we need to be very alert to uh, this discourse on solutionism, right? Uh, and, and not sort of, uh, sort of think we can invest in it too much. If the production of subjectivity is key to processes of capital accumulation, uh, the network theorist Tiziana Terranova made this very clear to us about 20 years ago in her essay on free labor that many of you would be familiar with. Um, I would wonder then if there is a technical regime, uh, sorry, a temporal regime that is also specific to processes of subjectivation. Since the production of subjectivity intersects, intersects with um, the techniques of production, this is also a question of time and technology. In short then, uh, we could ask what is the time of digital media? And it's in this final section on uh, media theory in post-digital conditions that I wish to start to elaborate an idea of uh, temporality uh, within the technical present. So in some ways, um, the media question has become more uncertain than ever. Media theory seems eclipsed by the ubiquity of its objects. As technologies of mediation increasingly find their way into societies of sensation and economies of calibration, the monopoly of knowledge hitherto enjoyed by the discipline of media and communications is now harangued in a world where everyone is an expert. Within the academy, many disciplines claim the authority to speak about digital technologies, mathematicians, urban planners, engineers, biologists, health scientists, sociologists, architects, I mean the list goes on here. Across society at large, we are all invited to comment and find it increasingly difficult to extricate ourselves from the pressure to connect. Yet a crystallization of thought often enough emerges from moments of crisis, if indeed this is the current situation of media theory. While many of us identify with transdisciplinary methods or embrace forms of disciplinary promiscuity, there remains a distinction of media theory within environments governed by digital objects. As media approach a universal condition of integration with labor and life, the organic and inorganic, the question of power, it seems to me, becomes amplified. Media theory asserts its ontological and epistemological dimensions when a curiosity in the material properties and tendencies of communication power, uh, communications media is coupled with a critical interrogation of the operation of power. So, if um, calculation machines have displaced representational regimes, then the ontological properties of media become secondary to the procedural routines of sorting, classifying, correlation, pattern recognition, prediction, and preemptive action. All of the things that we saw earlier today in this sort of crisis model um, that was presented to us. 
If power is understood as imminent to processes of subjectivation and techniques of governance, then the production and distribution and force uh, of power is similarly internal to the more epistemological procedures as distinct from the ontological properties of media. But it is a power whose limit is defined by what I wanted to explore here as the interval. So in these last few paragraphs, let me elaborate a little bit on that. As much as systems of classification aspire to totality, their logic is haunted by the intervention of the gap that distinguishes one category from the next. Within ecological conservation professions, this problem is referred to as the taxonomic impediment in which insufficient information and knowledge of planetary biodiversity can be overcome by additional training of taxonomists and museum curators. Certainly this is one way to formulate a discourse that maintains, uh, that can make claims on funding for the future pr profession, uh, of, uh, future of particular professions. But it does not address the epistemological void uh, and political potential that subsists in the interval between one and zero which is also the mathematical foundation of the digital and the basic architecture upon which computational procedures are built. The concept of the interval can thus be understood as a space of pure contingency and unintelligibility or incommensurability. The interval comprises that which evades power, uh, the power of decisionism, but is nonetheless subject to it. So in contrast to the discrete points of the digital, which is the decisionism of the digital, if you will, the world of the analog is defined by continuous variation. It's attempting to attribute to the analog the verdancy of materiality in all of its splendor. Yet we know all too well uh, the materiality of the digital, from the monocrystalline silicon substrate of printed circuit boards to the architectural form of data centers stuffed with server racks, from the copper alloy of coaxial cable to the bodies in pain that mine elemental metals such as copper from the Chilean mountains. As a technological object in an electronic system, the digital is both produced and conditioned by multiple variants of the material world. Needless to say, at the operational level, the digital is constitutive of habits and routines across a panoply of institutional settings, urban systems, and industrial sectors to the extent that what might at first appear uh, as non-digital, say the working of teaching and administration, or call center work, or driving long haul trucks across the Nullarbor Plain that stretches from the east to west coasts, coasts of Australia, is in fact intimately tied to and can be read back against the digital. The material, in other words, is losing sight of itself. Which is not to say that it vanishes so much as persists in ways beyond registration and external to the calibration machines of the digital. Within the society of metrics, neopositivism assumes authority within the disciplinary context of both the university and organizations such as government departments, think tanks, NGOs, lobby groups, and service companies tasked with the production of knowledge. Paradoxically, the task of media theory of the digital is to pursue thought and practice that is non-digital. This amounts to a politics as well, a politics that contests the digital decisionism of calculation and code, synthesis and connection, procedure and preemption. A media theory of the digital explores the properties of media to devise an aesthetics of disappearance in the society of tracking. The generation of social technical systems of non-standardization and indeterminacy amounts to a politics of secrecy and non-transparency alive to contingency and incomputable. Briefly, my suggestion on how to stage and make operational and aesthetics of disappearance would turn back precisely to the digital logic of the interval. An aesthetics of disappearance consists of media because they are ubiquitous, the digital because its binary decisions don't register the material, and the material because it isn't fully registered by the digital. Within an aesthetics of disappearance, or what we might now call the materialities of digital media, time accumulates, no matter the microtemporality of the interval within computational systems. Time outside extraction technologies is time to live otherwise. Thank you very much.